What's up, Spikes? Welcome to the Gauntlet wrap up. Uh, this was for the Prism, Prism. Gauntlet, which A was Agro Prism, Agro Agro Blitz Prism, which is currently uh, maybe my favorite deck in the entire game. Build a uh, page specialty. Yeah, only person playing it. It uh, spoilers for those of you who are watching the wrap up instead of watching all five of the videos. Um, I I won two of the games out of five, um, and the two that I won, I think, had very something very. Uh, very obvious in common. Yes. <laughs> uh, turns out when you have a deck that's based around uh, enablers and payoffs, if you draw an enabler and a payoff in every hand for the entire game, it goes pretty well. That's, yeah, that <laughs> goes exactly as you reeled it up. Yeah. Like, um, this deck's perfect. Why would you play anything else? This deck is insane. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, um, I, I still really enjoyed how the deck played. Uh, I think a lot of the changes that I made from the first version of the deck, uh, which I think you were anticipating to play against initially. Yeah. Uh, I, I had brought it to a local armory event uh, and got absolutely rocked. Uh, went like the easiest 04 of my entire life. Didn't even have to think about it. And um, it had a lot to do just with how greedy i had made the deck i added too many high cost cards and when you're looking to add two things together if one of them costs one and the other one costs two you know the the reason that i changed it around is now my payoff is now the first card costs one the second card usually costs zero or also one yeah because so if, you, if you're trying to do a like add two and one you you can't pitch yellows to give it go again exactly basically. yeah so made it a lot more awkward um to do it that way so the first version of the deck was pretty bad, and then I revised it and brought it to the gauntlet, and I feel like it it generally played a lot better, a lot smoother. It had more things to do, um, but we can talk about that more in each individual game, yeah. because getting into the wrap-up, the first game was against Dromai, uh, and this one did end up being a win for me, thankfully. Um, I, yes. There was, uh, we, we've already posted the video, and we've seen a couple comments on it. Um, there was, uh, I think at least one person that commented that Jan, you did technically have me dead on board uh, if you had used your um, silken form to create another uh, Ashwing. Oh, but oh. that was something that we were discussing. Yeah, and I'm I, I definitely mind gamed you out yes. of that. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> is that I think the comments left in like you talking about how you mind gamed me yeah. was left in the episode, <laughs> but the like. 12 minutes of it actually <laughs> happening wasn't yeah. so all you see is me like start my turn and just do things and then not win the game you don't see the 12 minute lead up to be yeah. like well if i do this then i can and then he's like maybe i've got <laughs> yeah there was there was a lot behind the scenes yeah. where that was actually considered i do want to make it very known and obvious yes. that you didn't just straight no, up miss just, that yeah we did take that into account and i i sort of you know just the way that you do uh when you're trying to angle shoot and win in the matchup that you yeah. created yourself <laughs> yeah i didn't build either of those decks yeah so i uh yeah, so that did end up being a win. Yeah. Uh, something that I did want to point out for this game specifically is a really interesting angle use case for a specific ruling yeah. uh, for heralds in general. Um, for those of you who didn't know, uh, Herald of Erudition, when it hits, it goes into your soul and you draw two cards, which is similar to a lot of the heralds. I think they most of, most them, of them on hit do a thing and yeah, go in your soul. Yeah, on hit, there's like Herald of Protection, which creates a, a spectral shield. There's Wartoon Herald, which just goes into your soul. It doesn't have any other on hit. But the thing that's important about that is that it does say hit and not hits a hero. Yeah. So when Herald of Erudition hits an ally, which is, you know, obviously you're not able to... Yeah. All the dragons are. You're not able to block to yep. mitigate that. Um, so that's basically just a guaranteed on hit trigger, uh, which was quite nice when I was mm -hmm. able to do that. For one of us, it was nice. Yeah, it was it was super nice for, for this guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that made that matchup uh, a little bit more interesting, I think, for the prism player, obviously, mm -hmm. um, that you're able to kind of angle shoot like that. And uh, it does kind of seem I was looking back on it and I was like, well, I just traded that one card plus the card I pitched for two extra cards in my hand. But then you're also being set up with uh, a card and pitch to give all your stuff go again because yeah. you've already pitched a yellow. Uh, you're getting rid of one of the allies, which you wanted to do anyway. So like yeah. you end up on uh, you end up ahead on that. I was going to say, yeah, like I don't I think that is like 100 percent what you do. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you yeah, always yeah. pop whatever the scariest dragon on board is. And, uh, and it's like for free. It's free. You draw two <laughs> cards and now you're sitting there. Okay, I've still got four cards now. 
Um, yeah. You've set up the <laughs> the go again on the Herald. Uh, it's just it's yeah. Uh, yeah. It does the the thing that does make that um, like with that being said, that matchup still is a little bit awkward just because uh, I feel like the deck that I the prism deck as I've made it so far kind of has difficulty dealing with multiple wide threats because yeah. you want to do one or two big attacks every turn. And if you're throwing those into an ally, it makes it a lot less efficient. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, sometimes you're using two cards to turn your overloads into things that attack for eight. And uh, you've you've used your two cards. You kind of don't want to throw those into a dragon just right. for the sake of it. Um, if you had to, obviously you can. But eh. um, yeah, because I think the dragons, they just get to attack for free. They do. Yeah. Uh, so. so you're like they're able to actually create a board that sticks around and continues to present threats um whereas the the aggro prism deck uh, is very much the way that it's drawn up is just to be aggressive be yeah. aggressive um and uh yeah anyway i i thought that that game went pretty well for uh for me and was a good start to the to the gauntlet series yeah. in general <laughs> well i mean like e even though uh prism won i did think the drill my deck was a lot of fun to play and oh, it yeah. does have a ton of potential yeah it's it's by no means it, the game was close like it was not a, a runaway um for either side so i definitely mm -hmm. think it's it's feel i think i mentioned in the uh ending of that game it feels a lot like uh, soul shield prism mm -hmm. in that you're just making smaller things that uh kind of just attack in so yeah no i like i had a fun fun yeah. playing it it was no i think that drama is still a, yeah. a solid deck but yeah anyway so for that was it for for game one for game two uh this was an unexpected result i think for basically everybody uh, yeah <laughs> i 100 percent when i was looking at the lineup i was playing I was like, well, I'm going to lose the Icelander game <laughs> and we'll see how the other four go. Yeah. Just because uh, no matter what the configuration is, it seems that just like wizards have a hard time with Prism. Because mm -hmm. um, basically the, the overarching thing to remember in a lot of these matchups is with the exception of the last deck we I played, none of them are really traditionally running any attacks that will pop Phantasm. Mm -hmm. So the like eight base attack overload go again with <laughs> dominate you're like i can't block this in any sort of efficient way yeah and it it was it was interesting anyway for yeah. icelander uh prism did end up losing icelander took the victory on that one and i think what it basically boiled down to for that was the ability to proactively mm -hmm. provide um frostbites frostbites yeah, yeah to to really slow down the game plan that way um made a big difference uh, especially like i said the the first version of the deck i realized i was spending too much too many resources to do the things so i pared that down quite a bit as a result the deck actually does run pretty lean yeah. um it, i run mostly yellow cards and i'm looking to make a play off of a single yellow if yeah. possible um so even adding one frostbite makes hands more awkward it means that i don't have follow-ups for more pressure uh and then i think there was one turn where you were able to create three frostbites i think you had an arctic incarceration yeah i had a red arctic incarceration and that's all yeah. i had as i had to block everything else so yeah just and it on there basically and... turned into a time walk like yeah. I, I don't think i was able to actually do anything on that turn no if maybe one thing you... and it would have been pretty bad if i remember i think you ended up pitching cards to pay for the frostbites to activate your tunic to mm. like attack me for four <laughs> yeah i like it, and it's stuff like that like the the deck if you're not able to put the 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 a and b together like yeah. um you know the the uh, set up in the payoff then your average turn outside of that is pretty unimpactful um yeah. it is very much like a high roll aggro deck and that is what i designed it to be because when you high roll you can high roll really really yes. hard uh, and i i love it i think i've able i've been able to do big attack into double uh, fractal replication like exactly once and that's what i want the deck to do because it attacks for like 26 with dominate <laughs> so, which which game was that in i, uh, like I think that was one of those games i think it was just a a, a, a local armory because, game. Yeah, because I've definitely, it's been like, okay, attack for seven with dominate. Okay, block this. Okay, fractal replication. And I'm like, oh, God. And you're like, all right, and snatch for four. And I'm like, <laughs> stop playing cards. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, the, the proactive version uh, or the proactive way that the Icelander deck was able to play was good enough to trip up 
um, yeah, the the prism deck, which I think does make sense. Um, it, it should be that way. And yeah, the uh, other the other weird thing about the prism or the Icelander list that I was playing specifically is it's the pummel Icelander. It's not actually how you would traditionally play Icelander. Yeah. I think that also played in because there was a couple of um, attack actions that mm-hmm. uh, actually let me sort of block slightly better. Yeah, um, it was it was definitely weird on both sides. Yeah, it's just a very non-traditional matchup in general. Um, but yeah, I think even if you weren't playing Pummel Icelander, which <laughs> likely you're not, not. Probably, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> but I think that Icelander actually does have a decent matchup into mm-hmm. this deck specifically because of the way that you can throw up roadblocks. Yeah, I think that makes a big difference. Um, but however, the next deck uh, does not have any roadblocks no, whatsoever. Geez. Uh, so game three was versus Phi, and uh, Phi ended up losing. Prism uh, came out victorious on this yeah. one. And I think one of the main things um, that I had already alluded to earlier in uh, this discussion was if you're able to hit your A plus B consistently, this deck is really strong. And I'm pretty sure every turn in this game, I was able to attack you with an A plus B. I'm almost positive. <laughs> it's It's been a while and I've, I've purged it from my memory banks. Uh, but it was one of those like... Even on my side, playing Phi, so the nin- ninja decks tend to be like A plus B plus C plus D, but they're all just attacks. Like there's yeah. no, no, oh, you need a pump to do this. It's all just like, I'm going to attack you with this and then this. And since I did this, I get this Phoenix Flame and then this Draconic Sword. And which I also pretty much did every single turn. Yep. But the combined total of all <laughs> the things I did was still less than the one attack for nine. And like it's yeah. just kind of a... And it's less awkward to block. So it uh, while the Phi deck, I think, is actually pretty fun. I, I do have some I, I think I would have played Kadachis instead of mm-hmm. one. Uh, I think that's what most sword. people are, are sort of landing on right yeah. now is that Kadachi Phi is kind of the way to go. Yeah, um, just because it gives you a bare minimum if you're sitting there and you've had to block all out, which I think in the last three turns it was block with three cards, block with three cards, block mm-hmm. with four cards. At the very least, if the last card in my hand is a blue zero, it's two Kadachi attacks Uh, or even like a red zero. It's one Kadachi attack. And it just it's still a little bit of pressure because, um, you know, the ones add up. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the sort of situation where you're looking at it and you're like, well, I could pay two for two damage, like one and one, or I could pay two for three. But it's the fact that it's two separate it's two ones. Two separate attacks. Yeah. So one and one in the late game when you're when your opponent is like into the Kadachi range when yeah. they're Kadachi locked is what I usually refer to it as. Yeah. Um, if you're able to attack, if you only have one extra resource, you aren't able to attack with your sword. But if no. you're able to attack with one Kadachi, then instead of attacking for zero, you're attacking for one. Technically, it is. It's it's more flexible. It's less overall damage, but it's also more awkward in general. But it's it's so also it. it's one and one. Yeah. needs two cards to block exactly. instead of two so like yeah. if i'm going in for like two or three that's a one card block if i'm going for a one and one it's two cards or you're taking a damage yes and that's kind of what you want to be doing is either slowly pushing through the damage because i think all of these games came down to like two life one life just about yeah they were pretty close um, <laughs> and that's better than like so worst case scenario you're now down two cards mm-hmm. so yeah i so, think karachis even though they're not your chronic and i think that's why people originally were a little bit hesitant to jump on it but i think just the efficiency is yeah i I think the the ease of being able to actually put them into uh practice within a game uh versus the ember blade i think that just the the overall flexibility of the kadachis is probably better and probably would have um resulted in a slightly different result um because i think i only attacked with the ember blade once yeah i i don't think it was it was quite that much because again it's just a little bit clunky to use but um but yeah the other thing that was really important is in the first two turns i'm pretty sure i hit both of my herald of eruditions i'm yeah it's like crazy awkward to block those when when you're not playing uh big attacks or like a bunch of like a bunch of equipment so yeah it it ended up being uh just a little bit of a high roll um but thankfully i was able to win so haha that's that's two out of uh, two out of three so far it goes downhill from here though folks. yes <laughs> I, I will the thing i will say though at this point i was not confident <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even though we were getting into two decks that i've played quite a bit and i under, i was still not confident because 
<laughs> Especially because the next match was Kasai. Yes. So being a warrior, you get the fridge suite of equipment, which is great for the first Herald. Mm -hmm. But you still don't have a great blocking plan for these phantasms. Yeah, you don't really have any poppers. I mean, no. sometimes warrior decks will run like a one of um, nourishing, nourishing emptiness. emptiness. Yeah. yeah. So outside of that being the one of in your deck already, um, you're probably not going to see it. So no. probably can't rely on it for um, for any sort of phantasm. But anyway, against Kasai game four, I did end up losing. Uh, that was a, a loss for Prism. And uh, one of the things that did end up coming into play, I think, was the fact that you had the fridge suite. Because I think yeah. the first Herald of Erudition I attacked with, you were able to fully block it out. Yep. And then I followed up with like a, a yellow snatch for yeah. three or something. Which and I think like, I oh, didn't block. It was like, yeah. it, was, it was because the Herald was like two cards and a card in your soul. Um, and it's just easy, like block with all my equipment. And then the snatch comes in and I was like, well, I want all the cards in my hand because I think the main key to the fourth game was I think I took tempo very early yep. just by virtue of Kasai just wanting to be attacking twice. Mm -hmm. Like you're just consistently attacking twice. If you can throw out uh, attack reactions to push damage through your copper. Uh, but really your whole goal is like, okay, attack, 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 attack. And you know, you can't always efficiently block both sabers. Yeah. Um, especially when you are uh, an aggro deck that's running heralds because they're attack <laughs> actions. Hey. Yeah, that, that does. That did end up being actually quite relevant as well. Um, just the fact that you were able to pump up the um, the swords even just by a little bit. And then yeah. it's like, OK, well, I block with a, a uh, I block with a herald. OK, well, that's an attack reaction. It's now four. So now damage is still leaking through, yeah. which means that I uh, get more copper, which then leads up to the spirit bomb of blood on her hands. hands yeah, uh, which did, of course, end up being a pretty impactful turn, uh, if I recall correctly. I don't think it was it, it wasn't the, a fully charged one. No, it was only four um, and it wasn't a game ending turn, which is kind of what you're looking for. Yeah, but it did enough to kind of. I think at that like I was I was ahead on tempo and then I think you had a really big turn mm -hmm. and then the blood on her hands was enough to like push me back ahead. Yeah. And just sort of keep Yeah, of course. Like again, with um with this Prism deck being an A plus B like aggro deck, um, kind of a combo deck. It, like each individual turn is its own combo, you could say. But it, the more that I have to block, the less efficient my turns become. Down to the point of these turns do nothing. So the more you're able to actually get me to block with, the less impactful my turn will likely be. So even though this blood on our hands wasn't a game ending blood on our hands, it was enough to push me to the point where I probably wasn't able to do anything to try to push tempo back in my favor. Um, so I think it was definitely like an extremely good, like a well-timed and well-placed blood in her hands. Um, I think there was also an awkward, um, I don't know if it was a turn before that. There might've been some awkward turns, at least in my head. And I don't think we're gonna see them on camera. Cause I was thinking <laughs> through, no, it's yeah. the, the sequencing on Kasai stuff is usually like play a thing to give, go again, attack with a saver. And then you're not running a huge amount of straight up attack reactions. Mm. You're playing uh, at actions that are like, if you've attacked this turn, your next attack gets plus three sort of thing. So you're kind of like, you're breaking the combat chain, yeah. um, which is usually fine in regular tempo, except Phantasmal Footsteps. Um, it's actually cumulative. It's, it's not cumulative, but it is until at the end of end the of turn, turn yeah. and it doesn't have um, battle sort of or anything. Breaker. Yeah. So, so it's just its defense becomes one until end of turn. Yeah. So basically every single time I would attack, if the shoes came out, if I then tried to like re tempo. And I think that's why the blood on the hand, blood on her hands turn. I think I was thinking about that a lot because mm -hmm. if I was trying to push things in between to give bonuses, you just get to re-block with the shoes and then that just sort of messes the whole math up. Yeah, it could be a total of like four block, three yeah. block, and that for a single card is like pretty impactful. That's yeah. basically the equivalent of a card from my hand. Yeah, um, you don't even like get rid of the shoes at the end of the turn. They're just like, they're still there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that that did end up being somewhat relevant. Yeah. Um, and then also on the flip side, your shoes were also quite good in this matchup. The yes, Valiant Dynamos. Yeah, if you attack twice, you get the... Yeah, the, the Valiant Dynamos did end up putting in a decent amount of work, if I remember yes. correctly. 
Um, and then finally, uh, the last game of the series, uh, Briar. Uh, this one did end up being a loss, and it was uh, pretty devastating for me because it was the first time that I ever, um, I don't know, like, the, if if I wanted to relate this deck to a parable, to a, to a historic uh, moral of the story type beat, yeah. uh, I would say that this deck is, is basically just wax wings. And you mm. can fly real, real high with these because you can yeah. just, you can go... Like they're big light, attack, they're aerodynamic. They're light, they're aerodynamic. <laughs> they melt. <laughs> they melt. They're well constructed to a point. <laughs> so yeah, it's like you can you can have some really high highs with this deck, but also you have to be grounded back to reality by the fact that Phantasm has a downside. It does, <laughs> especially if you've played four games in a row where it has not come up even close to once. No. So it, yeah, uh, the, it's the a thing pretty pretty abrupt. <laughs> The thing that ended up being pretty impactful here was you had a lot of access to uh, car, like a surprising amount of access, yes. honestly, six plus to cards that had six or more attack. And uh, outside of that, I think it was um, it was uh, blossoming oh. spellblade. Yes, blossoming spellblade. There was burgeonings. Yeah, and, burgeonings. Um, I, there might have been one more, but I think you had recycled both the Blossoming Spellblade yes. and the Burgeoning with a Pulse, Pulse of Eisenloft of, as well. Uh, Pulse of Candlehold. Candlehold, right. Yeah, I don't That's get to play the, like, the fun one. Yeah. I get to play the, uh, the oh, bring them back. Yeah, yes. which ended up being actually even more devastating because yes. then I knew that they were in your hand and it's like, well, what am I going to do? Not attack you? Like, And most of the time this deck is actually like moderately fine with having its things destroyed, but yeah. not with the amount of consistency that you were able to provide. Which... It, honestly, from a like mathematical and like me thinking standpoint, so I was playing CMH Briar, so yeah. I was playing basically Earth skewed Channel Mount Heroic Briar, which is makes it extra bad for you because yeah. now all of my uh, Lightning Surge and all that, like the four attacks, are also now seven, mm -hmm. and so it just turns everything. So the fact that I was able to just like hit enough of just my like regular good old fashioned six attacks <laughs> uh, when it mattered um, was was pretty clutch. Yeah, it created a very awkward situation for me, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and then that, in addition to Briar just being a good deck, then obviously got you over the finish line. I don't think there's a there's a ton more that I really have to say about that. Like watching the game back, it's very obvious that the amount of tempo that was lost just from straight up you having the poppers, um, even though I don't remember it being on like super impactful stuff uh, for me, but it was just the consistent like the the consistent loss of tempo like cumulatively over the the turns uh and I, also not getting any damage through yeah I, was gonna say, I think i popped a herald early yeah and then i think uh you had like what was going to be a big turn and i popped like back to back yeah. seven attacks it was, it was i popped after the oh, yeah. candle hold yeah you popped i popped a thing you choose to get an action point and then i popped the follow-up and yeah, like, and from there, like, it's it's not just that I've been put into a, a, a lesser spot in terms of tempo. It's also that you didn't lose any life as a result yeah. of it. So you're able to then on a on a follow up turn, even if I did have a big follow up uh, or if I did have a big attack to try to push things through, you could likely just say, ah, eh, whatever, it's fine, yeah. and and have that sort of extra cushion to say, okay, it's fine. You you're allowed to have that, and then here's all of the Channel Man heroic stuff that I'm gonna throw at your face. Yes, so. yeah, exactly. Well, I need all. <laughs> these cards in my hand to kill you next turn so yeah i'll take seven it's yeah fine exactly so uh all in all uh this was again it was a, a two out of five for the prism deck realistically i still felt really good about it i think the the deck looks super fun <laughs> and i know i think if, if you watch the progression bill's having a ball throughout the entire day <laughs> regardless of what we're playing where it was happening and i think i try my best to hide it i'm not sure in the later games but every time there's like fractal replication like every game i just like get increasingly more and more emotionally dead inside <laughs> trying to figure out okay how am i blocking this nine attack with dominate <laughs> yeah. and it's just like uh. That's the that's the power of the deck. It's not yeah. necessarily that it is like an effective or consistent deck. Yes. It's the mind games. It's the fact that I'm pretty sure I was able to keep fractal replication in my arsenal for like the opportune moment. So it's like, okay, if that card in your arsenal is a is a fractal replication, I'm taking an additional nine damage. Is that good or am I dead? <laughs> yeah, that's like, what do I do about that? So, but I I, I had a lot of fun too. Like yeah. it, it was my first time playing 
three of these decks and um i think it's our first time showcasing heroes close to when they came yeah, out like relatively recent yeah so that, um, that was nice too so actually. i would play all of these decks again in fact well i i own kasai and briar and mm-hmm. i am looking at doing icelander as well but uh no i think they're all good like all the decks we played um and i would not like if i was gonna play prism Honestly, I think I would play this version just because playing that is it's fun. You're sharing to play to fun and play to fun, play to have fun. <laughs> you always play to fun. Yeah, uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels good when you win. And also, like, there's no pressure. Yeah. Like when you sit down, people are like, oh, you're playing Prism. And then people get really tense and you're like, I'm not playing Soul Shield Prism or any of these dumb things you're like surprise tag you for 15 yeah (laughs) like that's the that's the thing that i was actually saying uh earlier today when i when i first showed up to the studio and i was talking to jim um the thing that i appreciate most about this deck is that even in the the games that i've played like i the the win rate isn't spectacular for this deck i'm not going to say that this is the most impactful blitz deck that you could possibly play that you should play it if you want to bring it uh if you want to bring down like a skirmish or a calling or something but to me, when I first started playing Flesh and Blood, the thing that I noticed that I really enjoyed about the game was regardless of the outcome of the game, I was having a good time playing it mm-hmm. just in general. It was yeah. it was lots of fun. And then I think at some point that sort of shifted when I was paying more attention to the meta, yeah. paying more attention to which decks are good, which decks are powerful, it's putting those together. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, Kano is really strong. And then I try playing Kano and I'm like, I, this is too much thinking for me. It's and then it makes your opponents feel bad as well uh, playing against yes. a wizard um like that's obviously if you want to play a wizard i'm not saying yeah. that that is something you shouldn't do but just to me it didn't jive with how i wanted no. to play um and then there's yeah things like briar where you're very obviously um leveraging how strong rosetta thorn is in channel mount heroic and being able to do all these things and uh that didn't quite jive with me either quite as much um and it sort of got you know a little bit less and less where i felt personally like i was enjoying the game less because of it and then i rediscovered this um i had this idea for a while and actually one of our local players dana was playing a similar deck and it just kicked it off and i was like okay now i think i know how to put this deck together and I put it together. And even when I lose, I still have a really good time. Um, and I don't know if that sounds like copium. It probably is. But it like it's just fun. And I like having fun. <laughs> I feel like this is the evolution of your KO high roll deck where you like played it and you're like, this was miserable for everybody. But the concept is yeah, there. The and I think this is the fun. consistent concept <laughs> for for you. And yeah, it's, just being able to high roll sometimes being like, hey, I'm going to follow up with this fractal replication. And then every single person having yeah. to reread fractal replication to make sure that it's doing what I tell them it's actually yeah. supposed to do. It's like when you're trying to tell people what um, what spellbound creepers do. Oh, and God. you like they're like, OK, sorry, what does that do? And you're like, OK, you're not going to believe this. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to think that I'm going to think this is crazy. <laughs> I blocked your attack with an attack action. So and now, now I want to make 12 root chains. Yeah, now I get to <laughs> kill you. Yeah. Yeah. What? That doesn't seem right. You're like, I didn't write the card. Yeah, so anyway, at the end of the day, the thing that I wanted to say most about this deck is that I think that it does actually perform. Like, it is a deck that can function, mm-hmm. uh, which is extremely important. But it, again, to me, it's just a really, really fun deck. I love this deck so much. And uh, I'm really happy that I was able to actually put it through a gauntlet yeah. to sort of show people what has been taking up most of my mental real estate for the past couple months, honestly. Um, and still will. Like, and still will. Yeah, like I'm, I'm still going to be playing this deck, yeah. I think. We have our uh, our second local skirmish just coming up next week, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be playing this deck. Um, I don't really care that much about taking it down. Uh, getting to top eight is like fine enough. If I can do that with this deck, then that's the biggest badge of honor that I can possibly get. Yeah. I think <laughs> I'm going to say down in the brackets next week from when we film this. So yeah. like three weeks ago from when you're watching it. Yeah. Yeah. Like currently for us yeah. next week. But um yeah, anyway, I think that just about wraps up this wrap up. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else that, on it. Something like that. Well, how many times can we wrap this wrap up? Well, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> See you next time. (laughs) Thank you all so much for watching. We really appreciate your support uh, and hanging out with us today. Uh, Please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Uh, We are very thankful for all of our uh, loyal viewers and all of our new ones. Uh, Make sure to stay well and stay safe, and we will catch you all in the next gauntlet. Hey, thanks for checking out the Spike Feeders on YouTube. 
Before you close the window, make sure you click subscribe for more great flesh and blood content.